Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, I think the Bass continue. Pro's trying to sabotage our uh, podcast. I know, right? Uh, it's Google Chrome, too. Google Chrome has been an absolute nightmare for StreamYards. Uh, I already kind of I reached out to them to kind of get some help on that stuff. Uh, but to continue our conversation uh, from earlier, the school, compare and contrast school sizes on the Upper Potomac to the Susquehanna, are they about the same? Do you get 30 to 40 fish schools, or is it more of like one or two here, one or two there? Uh, on the Potomac? Yeah. Uh, no, you're going to get like a um, uh, three to six fish out of a hole, uh, you know, normally. But no, no, you can catch fish. You can catch a, a dozen or more fish in an eddy on the Potomac River. Anyway, while Jeff figures that out, I'm going to finish my thought process now that we got our audio situation uh, figured out here. You got to love uh, StreamYards. Bless you guys so much. Um, so while Jeff gets his stuff figured out, we're going to be getting back on topic here. Again, um, we are still on Instagram since Instagram is going to be shutting down soon. If you would like to join us uh, on Patreon, you can get the full thing and you get the whole playlist as well. So some of the baits that I think are absolutely important this time of year for me, besides the, the gulp... Um, let me pull these up here. And I'm going to show you my setups and absolutely everything. Uh, one of them, if you're not fishing the rivers, and this is a bait that I was going to show you guys at the last Jake's Bait and Tackle tackle review we did, but I didn't have it with me. This is an ounce and a half uh, blade, uh, underspin. This is an ounce and a half version, and this is a super see-through, clear um, shad imitation jerk bait here, which is absolutely perfect for a Lake Frederick, a reservoir like the aquaquan places like that where you get that clear water because the point of this bait is you have to get it down in that column and with when you have a blade a big blade like this this is going to give that bait lift and it's wanting to lift up off the water column because of that because this blade creates lift you need to get with that even heavier head and i see some people do like a three eighths you got to go super extreme go to that ounce and a half maybe two ounces if you're fishing 20 30 feet of water because you generally want this thing bumping closer to the bottom uh it looks like we have jeff here again let's try his internet connection all righty is it better yes i can see your face it's amazing all right Praise the Lord. Um, so as we were talking, and we'll continue here, um, Susquehanna River. Yeah. Compare and contrast how the Susquehanna fishes this time of year with the Upper Potomac. Well, um, you're going to find more fish in the eddies in the, on the Susquehanna River. Um, some of those some of those holes in the Susquehanna River have just an enormous amount of fish. The population of smallmouth on the Susquehanna River is incredible. Really? Yeah. Um, but uh, to, to compare it, so like uh, a really good hole in the Potomac for me when I take a trip out is like six fish, just one hole. And then on the Susquehanna, um, it would be like 12. Wow. That's insane. Wow, dang. So that, that, that is a huge difference. Has it, has it always been like that? Yeah. No, or is it just something new now that way? But I mean, they, they, they both fish really well. I mean, um, you know, and the, uh, the, 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 the rivers are just completely different. Um, the Susquehanna river is moving at twice the speed of the Potomac river at any given time. Hmm. That makes a big difference in the cold water. Interesting. Because, um, so it's fish in the eddies. Is that water moving so fast and so cl when it's That's... cold and fast, they get out of that current. But if the water's just casually moving down the river, like it does on um, a few parts of the Potomac, you can catch them catch them in the middle of the river in January. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Because um, at least when I fish uh, at Four Locks or Big Slack. And again, I guess, guys, that's, that's a reservoir. I understand that. Or or even when I look at like the Shenandoah, for instance. Yeah, the, it's not really ripping right now. And a lot of that has to do with the rain and not having a lot of water. But do the fish hold, like you said, to eddies? Or as you said, 
do you just see them roaming in the river? Say that again. In lower current, what do they do? How do they act? They just hang out in the middle of the river. They just, uh, they're probably getting behind rocks. I picture, uh, um, you know, you're, you're going to want four or five feet of water. And um, they're probably behind rocks where the current is getting, um, where it's breaking up the, um, the rocks are breaking up the current. And um, you just happen to bounce your bait past them and they pick it up. So basically the same places they are in the summertime? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in different parts of the river, you know, I mean, you, you need uh, slow, real slow moving water. And then you have that entire giant um, area of river that you have to go poke around in to find fish. How do you break that down? You just a little, little by little sections in your, you know, in your head to break it down. Like I'm going to fish on, uh, you know, from the Virginia side out to the middle of the river. Um, kind of pick locations on the on the shoreline. You pick an area that's, uh, I don't know, 50 yards by 50 yards and fish it. And then move on. That's, that's yeah, that's pretty crazy. Because, like, that's the one thing I've noticed, too, with just how many people I've talked to. When you're in the river, you have to cover water slowly, which is such a, it doesn't make sense. Um, that's why I'm always on the river. Because I'm out there and I'll fish in a section for hours that's um, just as big as a football field. And that's it. Looking for fish. And sometimes I don't even find them there. And the next, next, the next day I go back out and I look, I look again in another spot. With that said, let's say you've a guy, I'm going out with you. Okay, I'm going out. Yeah. In this scenario, in the wintertime, how long are you get to a spot where the fish are, are, are kind of? Uh, we'll give it a little bit longer. We'll give an area 30 minutes. Not a spot, an area. And, and I'm catching them too by drifting real slow. So the thought is that um, a lot of the times you should be sitting completely still. And that's true. But uh, there's times where you have to cover the water too. So I'm going to use the trolling motor and, con and drift and control my boat and drift it real, real, real slow uh, while I'm fishing. That's pretty smart. Yeah. I, how do you... When you drift, are you trying to drift alongside the eddy or through the eddy? No, um, away from it, on the side of it, and away from it. That's a, that, that that would be if it's on the shoreline or in the mid river eddy. But I'm just talking about the middle of the river. Mm. And then and then it depends on how clear the water is and how close you want to get to those holes. If the water's real dirty, like it has been, you can be right up on the hole and catch them in the hole because they can't see you. That's really good advice. And guys, you know, if you want to drop a drop a question in the comment section below, I will try to get it answered. Maybe we'll give away some gift cards as well to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, the one one thing that's been interesting is so many people I've talked to, they really downsize this time of year. Oh yeah, super tiny baits. Is that something that you like to do? And this is a great segue so we can start talking about the baits in, in your store. As we're looking around, I absolutely love how you hold your maps up. <clears throat> Old school, baby. I pen them in areas where I catch fish. Why do you like just just for people at home? Because we got a bunch of new people listening. Why do you like to use a map and pen it that way versus like a GPS unit? Well, I guess I, I, I guess I'm hoping that I'm going to see some type of pattern. Visually see something that I can't see when I'm on the river. And then it reminds me of where the fish are all the time and where I've caught them, you know, this year. I don't keep it from the year before. Do you I change it? Yeah, I change it. Oh, really? It. There's some spots that are, there's some spots that are uh, uh, pretty consistent. And then there's others that there's fish in them, but they're just not there all the time. Do you change it by season or just by year? By year. No, I use those maps just for winter time. Oh. That's how uh uh that's how much I enjoy fishing in the winter. But but why do you do that? Why why just for the winter time? So I can find where they are. And I can uh I can like I said, so so I can see if there's a pattern of of, of where they are. 
what it looks like. But couldn't you do that other times of the year as well? I just yeah, I could, but I, I just I just like doing it in the winter time because I feel like the winter time is the hardest time of year to catch them. That makes sense. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And they bunch up a little bit more too. Yeah, yeah, they group up. Yeah, that's dang, dude, that's so. Cool. I would consider a smallmouth a schooling fish, at least in the river, because that they don't need each other. A crappie need that they need each other. Bluegill, they need each other. Um, I I consider smallmouth groups, packs or groups, and they'll group up from time to time um, to chase bait and feed. And then, for instance, if there's a big rock out there that's breaking current, a lot of the smallmouth know it's there, so they're going to pull up next to it in the wintertime. Not because there's other fish there, just because that's a good spot to sit. Right? That makes a lot of sense. I mean, do you think they school up or school up bunch up this time of year by, by size? Or like, I, do you see like a... No, you know, I've thought that before. Um, but or they kind of just... You, you'll catch them in various sizes. I mean, you'll catch a 21-inch smallmouth next to a 14-inch smallmouth. So I, I don't know what's up with that. But um, if there's a big fish in there, there's more likely there's another big fish in there too, you know, pretty good size one. I agree with that. I really agree with that. That Yeah, that, that that's at least what I've seen on the river too when I've gone out there is you can't just say like, okay, there's only little ones here. You got to work through them um, to get to your, to your bigger one. And the eddy size thing is so interesting because it seems like on the Susquehanna this time of year, a lot of it has to do with islands too. Um, there's so many islands compared to like the Shannon, uh, the, the Potomac. Yeah. No, there is, man. I mean, uh, um, uh, the, they're completely two different rivers. And uh, I mean, I almost think smallmouth are completely different, you know? They're just, their behaviors are different. The uh, the Potomac smallmouth are a lot pickier. They are. They are, they are a lot pickier. And I feel like you fish shorelines, too, way more than on the Susquehanna. I could be wrong. It's a hot take, but... Instead of fish, uh, when it's cold, of course, like right now. Oh, yeah. No, no. I'm looking for shorelines because because there's not as much um, structure or islands as there is in the uh, on the Susquehanna. Hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That makes sense. That really makes a lot of sense. And we got a, we got a comment right here. Here's a good one. Uh, I like waiting the... Oh, God. Help me, Jeff. What is that word? Aquaquan. Is that the Aquaquan? <laughs> is that... Aquaquay Creek, uh, something like that. Aqu Ask them what, what, where is that? What, what, where is that creek? What state is that creek in? And in what river is it on? Yeah, same. Yep, Jeff, you heard Jeff. Where, where is that? Uh, do you think uh, marking maps in the same fashion you mark rivers would be as useful? So his question is: I fish a creek. Do you think marking maps uh, for a creek would be as, as useful as a river? Yeah, I do. You have to find a map for that creek, though. Yeah, and why wouldn't it be helpful, honestly? I mean, it'd be helpful at any time of the year. I just feel like in the wintertime, I mean, that's this is the time I really enjoy fishing. And um, I, I think you, you have to really concentrate on what you're doing. And um, for, for me, having a visual, uh, uh, something to visually refer back to helps. I think it does, too. And I still, I like to even just, I like to honestly... I like to buy those maps because they don't really make them anymore, honestly. Yeah. The, um, what's his name? George, uh, the guy that owns these maps, the map company. Here, let me get his. Let me get the name of it. Yeah, oh, go grab um, the name of it real quick while I get through some of these uh, some, Jake's some of these tackle questions here. Him. Jake's bait and tackle sells. Yeah, Jimco. They're called Jimco here. Get them on here. Amazon, eBay, They're places like Jimco's. that. Jimco's. These phones are a hot mess. Hold on. Can, can you see it? Uh, I know. I know your feeling. Uh, I see it. I mean, it's it's sideways, but that, that's the best I can do. Jim Pro Series map. They're, they're still nine ninety five. Dude, those things are awesome. And uh, what, what I'll do is um, uh. remind me at the end of this podcast, and I'll leave his telephone number for people to call if they want maps. Okay, good call. He used to be a guide on the Lower Potomac. So, and he's moved away. He lives in North Carolina now. And then uh, we got... We got... Uh, 
I might have misspelled it. Uh, I might have misspelled it from Front Royal up through Winchester Inwood up through Shepherdstown, I believe. That's the name of the creek, and that's where it's located. Is from Front Royal up through Winchester Inwood, uh, up through uh, Shepherdstown. Uh, so it's the. Uh, so is he talking about the Shenandoah? Yeah, it's a connection into the Shenandoah is the name of it. And so, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Like the Conakajig Creek up near me, that's another one where if you can mark those wintering holes, that'll help a lot. And I think there's something about visual. Um, yeah. We'll get back there. It's like, okay, GMCO, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, guys, yeah, th and thanks to all my Patreon supporters. Uh, you guys are the reason, like, this show even exists right now. And I really just want to take a moment to say thank you. Um, and we're, as we're talking about visualization, this is why I like 360 so much versus just panoptics or uh, forward-facing sonar is – it makes this nice side scan view of your whole boat. So you can visualize the rocks. You can visualize 360? where the stumps are. Yeah, 360. Yeah, you know. Like the, th the 360 is absolutely amazing how it just gives you that visual representation of what's going on. I was knocked off. Oh, and you're back. Um, I'm, I'm in the back. I'm backstage. <laughs> no, you're here now. Oh, uh, Okay. Um, so let's just get into the bait section of this show. So why don't you, uh, if you got a handful of baits there, why don't we, uh, get started? Yeah. Hey, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the fishing line. Absolutely. Love it. All right. So this is the stuff I use. This is the stuff, um, I use on my guide service and, um, these, uh, this is what I recommend. Um, first one is the gamma torque. It's braid. I prefer 20 pound or 25 pound braid. Okay. All right. And uh, the green color. I think all they do is sell it in green, but I could be wrong. But um, I, I prefer that on a spinning reel. And uh, that's going to be your, um, you know, primary line on your reel. Right. And remember, you need backing for braid. So you're going to have to find some kind of uh, a monofilament or fluorocarbon that you can tie on your spool first and then tie it to the braid and then pull the braid on the reel. Because if you put the braid straight to the reel for most of these reels, it'll just spin around on the spool. Have you ever had that happen? I've had that happen way too many times. Yeah, and, then, and then there's companies that are smart and put like a rubber ring in the middle of the spool. I don't know why everyone doesn't do that, but... Um, and then it for, makes, what'd you say? I said, it makes sense. And then for, um, your leader lines, uh, this stuff right here, this is a 10 pound stuff right now, but 10 pound, eight pound, 10 pound or six pound, uh, fluorocarbon. This stuff has never let me down. I mean, people are paying me money to take them out fishing and, uh, it just doesn't let me down. And then there's another, there's another type of, um, uh, fluorocarbon I like using, and that's from Sunline. It's called Sunline Shooter. I love shooter. Is it? Is it? Sun, yeah, Sunline Shooter, and then the other one is um, Su Sunline Sniper. It's. I don't sell it. Um, I can't get a hold of it for some reason, but it's. Uh, you'll find it, and I like the eight pound. Uh, Sunline um, Sniper, and it's like a camo color. I don't know why it's camo. That's not why I buy it. It's just. That's just the color it is, mm. but you'll, you'll find it like tackle warehouse. Uh, Jake's bait and tackle might have it too though, but it only comes at 82 and a half yards of, uh, of line. And they're almost, it's 40 bucks a spool. Which makes it great for just leader material. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean the, the, the stuff's absolutely, that's my number one line. Um, and then this one comes in a close, close, you know, right behind it. But this stuff's American made. I mean, this stuff, these people are in uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then um, I just did a video recently on YouTube. I, I put it out on my YouTube, Shallow Water Fishing Adventures YouTube channel. And I was talking about fishing lines, starting off my series of uh, how to catch uh, river smallmouth in cold water. And uh, I talked about copolymer and uh, monofilament line. And... They're very, very, very similar. But I really believe the copolymer is better than the monofilament. And I use this stuff right here. Why? I just think it's better. 
I, I, I just think it's uh, more abrasion resistant. I think it ties knots better. And um, I mean, I've never had uh, the line break. Hmm. And it takes a lot to snap it off if you have to uh, break the line off on rocks or uh, trees. We, we have a question from a Patreon member here. Tony asks, any tips to keep reels from birds nesting? Yeah, what, what kind of reels? I'm, bait casters with... or spinning reels? We got to know that first. Let's, uh, let's assume it's a bait caster, and then we can talk about spinning reels as well. If it's a bait caster, you need to use your thumb and control it, right? Number one. Number two, you need to find the, um, the sweet spot for the braking system on whatever, whatever that um, lure is that you're using. You're going to have to adjust that uh, bait caster every time you put a new lure on there if it's a different size. Lure or bait, Right? If you don't do that, it's going to it's going to backlash and it's going to uh, you're going to lose all your line because you're going to have to strip it off. There so, you go, but guys. a spool, I mean a spinning reel, you have to flip the bale manually. So when you open the bale manually with your uh, with your uh, hand to, to cast it, once it hits the water, flip it over with your hand. Do not use the handle to, to to um, crank it over. Because if you do that, um, from what I've been told by people that actually, um, the, the companies, and then uh, just guys that are just good fishermen and, and other guides and stuff, I've asked them too. And I'm like, well, why is that the case? They say, because you have to manually flip it over. Because if you don't, it gives that line like a half twist every single time. And eventually it's just an absolute nightmare and it comes out and it just tangles up. Mm. So you have to manually flip the bale. Tony, there you go, man. We answer your question. And then real quick. And then it depends on your line, what size line you're using for the bait you're using. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the smaller, the lighter line you use, you just have to pay attention more when you, when you're fishing, you have to look down at your uh, spool, after you cast, make sure your line isn't, um, there isn't a, a, a bow in your line or a, you know how your line will sometimes go over top of the front of your spool on a spinning reel? Have you seen that, Thomas, before? Yep, I have. Yeah, you got to make sure that that, you got to get that out of there. And, and the one thing I would say that would help you with the bird's nesting of your bait caster is, um, going back to that one, don't over, don't add too much line to your spool. Go oh, there like, you go. Yeah. Go half the way with it. And then the, the lighter, the line, the more it's going to want a bird's nest too. So and I'm going to go to extremes here for the example, but if you try to spool up eight pound test, that's going to want to wrap more than 14 pound test. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Uh, and then it comes down to your real size. I mean, let's be real here. A little bit more expensive reel, a hundred dollar to $150 reel is going to be a little bit better than a $40 reel with the braking mechanisms as well. Um, so ho hopefully Tony, that, that, that helps you out there. Um, and then wh where were we going? I was started off with the line, right? Yeah. You started off with the line. Well, um, and then we're going to segue from there for those reasons. I've gravitated towards spin casting reels easier from sitting position in the kayak. Absolutely. Now I just want to add one more thing to this and then we'll get to the baits. The, the thing a bait caster does better than anything is precision casting. It's, it's, it's like a scalpel. And when you cast a spinning rod, you really got to use your other hand to stop it. So if you're casting into lay downs and trees and stuff, the bait caster is kind of nice because you can cast and you're like, uh-oh, it was going too far. And you can put your thumb on it real quick and stop it. So that's where cat bait casters are so nice is it's so easy to precision lean, make sure you don't hit the dock and whatever. But my apologies, uh, Jeff, we can, we can get back. Oh, to, no, that's uh, fine here. Let me grab something real quick too. Then we got Mitch's fish. We're going to get this. We're going to get this in. Oh yeah. We're going to get All everything right. in. I got Mitch's fishing. Um, okay. The, the name that I can't pronounce because apparently I am a brain damaged individual, which if you guys have watched the show, you know, I am basically brain damaged. Uh, Apicoakion. Apicuon, Apicuon Creek dumps in the Potomac on Big Slack. I think the campground is called the yeah Isaac Walton. Does it dump it at Isaac Walton? I don't. Does that really dump it at Isaac Walton? Man, you're gonna make me want to actually Google this thing to find out. All right, here we go. Are we ready? Yes, we got it. We're we gonna gotta... move from the uh, fishing line real quick, and then we're gonna get into the lures. But the uh, the rods and the uh, the reels. 
I like using 1000 series reels for uh, spinning reels when it comes to uh, plastic baits and smaller, those smaller lures you're talking about, right? Two and three quarter inch tubes, um, the Z-Man Ned rigs, the ticklers, those baby goats that are two and three quarter inches that you, you can use a 15th ounce uh, jig head, eighth ounce, three thirty second ounce, 16th ounce on. And you want to use something like I have, which is a seven foot uh, medium action, I'm sorry, um, medium light rod. Can you guys see that? Yep. All right. And then uh, it's just, it's really hard to see, but just the um, medium light rod. All right. For the, um, I have, I have uh, one of these right now available. This is a backyard customs rod from Steve Fogel in Frederick, Maryland. He builds them for me. I'm telling you, these rods are awesome for uh, river smallmouth. Now, everything I talk about on here has to do with river smallmouth. Um, that's all I that's all I go after are the river smallmouth. And then occasionally I catch muskie by accident or walleye, and I have experiences with other fish. Uh, large mouth. Sometimes I can um, I get on a a group of large mouth, and I can go back to them for days and keep catching them off of trees. But Everything I have is geared towards river smallmouth, if that's what you're interested in. And then this is a, like I said, this is a medium light, right? And that's what you need for those plastics. And then for the, um, uh, like the jerk baits, the pointer 78s, the pointer 100s. And then once we get out of winter time and you start talking about spring and warmer waters, crank baits, spinner baits, chatter baits, stuff like that, you want a, uh, a medium rod. And this one right here is a seven foot medium that I have for sale right now too. All right. Yeah. It even has my uh, logo on it. This one right here is a seven foot. This one will do an eighth ounce up to, uh, I can never remember them to a half ounce. Okay. And then I would on this rod right here, I would put something that's around a, um, 2000 or 2,500 series reel. Okay. And the type of reels that I like using are those Diolas because they don't break the bank. Yeah. Okay. And this rod right here right now is on sale, guys. Just go to my website. I think Thomas can put that down in the uh, description. It's already but, there. Um, I have plenty of these rods and, and stock the medium rods. Um, and like I said, the medium lights, I have one right now and I can have two other ones built. I just need to give them a call. Um, he has them, has the blanks for him. And then the raw, and then the reels real quick, you got 2,500 series reels like these Tatulas. I think they're going to stop making the tool, the, uh, Tatulas. I only have one of these left, but this is a 2,500 series, but these are right here. These are the best reels for the, uh, bang for your buck. These Fuegos, these things fish like $200 reels. And these are on sale, I believe right now on my website. Can you guys see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So that's what I have to say about the setups. Now to get to the lures, what do you want to look at first, Thomas? You have a Matt. He is Bass Pro Shop. He gets to start. He's Willy Wonka in his candy factory. Hold on. Let's see here. We got to start with real quick, as usual, because it's winter time. We got to start with two and three quarter inch tubes. And my best-selling tubes right now, you guys can see. Can you guys see them? Yep, we can see them. So, one of them's a green pumpkin, one of them's a purple, and one of them's a dark purple. You see that? So, these are my best-selling tubes right now for winter time. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why is purple so hot in a river that's super clear? <laughs> We'd have to ask the fish that. They just like it, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the crawdads uh, that you see when it gets real cold, they get purple and blue colors on them. That's true. You know, and then when they get, when they're, when they're warm, they get orange. And then people are like, well, why isn't your green pumpkin one orange? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but they do. They like, uh, you know, they get a, a bluish, purplish color to them in the wintertime. That's crazy. And then we got, we got a couple of, we got Greg, uh, Greg has a question here. Um, 
Greg Horning. Jeff, how do you rig your tubes? How do you like to rig your tubes? With a uh, ball head jig, an eighth ounce ball head jig. I, I have those two. Uh, number one hook. Hmm. You can use a number two hook as well. I, I have those as well, but number one hooks um, on, a, on an eighth ounce ball head. That's kind of important there, uh, getting that hit, that head right, because you don't want it so heavy that it gets stuck on every rock. Yeah, and then, and then, and then it, you want to go, you want to start there. And then you can go to a 16th ounce or a 332nd ounce, depending on how slow the water is. And then if the water's moving real fast, you might have to go up to like a 316th. But then you have to be prepared for getting hung up sometimes. True. That is, yeah. I didn't even think of that, dude. That, that makes a lot of sense. But mm. sometimes the fish, even in the, uh, when, it, when there's some, a little bit of current in the wintertime, they don't want that bait moving. They want it sitting still for whatever reason. Even if it's in a little bit of current. How fast do you work your tubes this time of year? Real, real slow. Like literally I'll throw them out and I'm, I'm letting the current take them. Mm. And I'm not doing much at all with them. Just every so often, maybe a little bit of a, a wrist action with your wrist. Interesting. Yeah. And, and one thing I like to do guys. Um, and then if you, would you like to get your next bait and we'll get to some more questions. Oh, sure. Um, and then um, oh, here's some here's some jig heads for the uh, for those Ned style baits right here. This one, these are uh, these are the Z Man ones. These are one fifteenth. I even have one twentieth, but the one fifteenth. That's yep. how small I go. Over a little bit more. Yep. There you go. Perfect. Right here. Wow. Um, but I also sell a, a finesse jig head as well. Uh, where? I have that. I'll show it to you in a second. And then here's the here's the three um, uh, here are the three types of Z-Man baits I find um, the most success with on the river. One of them is that baby goat. Remember I talked about that. Baby goat, baby. Baby goat, right there. That's a good bait. Um, and then the the colors that I'm showing you: Canada Crawl, uh, Green Pumpkin. That's all. Those are all great colors. And then here we go, TRD Tickler. If no one's throwing a Tickler, this is a 365-day-a-year bait right here. Can you I guys see the back of it? I loves that thing, yeah. Uh, it, they, they love it. I am so frustrated with that bait because I have, I have, a, I have a friend uh, who, who we fish with a lot, and he can kick your ass with that stupid bait on any body of water. And I just don't know what makes it so special. I, I don't either, just... man. I, I, it's got the best of both worlds. It's that little Ned rig, but it looks, maybe it looks like a crawdad too. I don't know. But the Ned rig, I think is supposed to be a crawdad as well. Yeah. To them. No, and then I here's, and, and then here's your, just your, your everyday Z-Man Ned rig. The TRD. Oh dude, that's like my go-to. Yeah, so I mean, and they've been uh, on the Potomac and the Susquehanna. We've been catching them on those, um, on those uh, Neds, on the TRDs, regularly, and the uh, Ticklers. I mean, and then you guys know, like this is my power setup right here. But yeah, TRD. You know, June Bug is one of my favorite colors that they produce. Uh, even and I've got water. June Bug. Yeah, <laughs> June Bug is a great color. It's those darker colors that make no sense. Like, I, like if you told somebody that in clear water you're gonna throw purple and and black and you're gonna have success to be like wait really and it's like yeah they they yeah i don't know really what well. they see and i you could probably ask people all day long who knows how they see underwater i'm wondering you know when you pull a bass out a small mouth out of the water you're holding it um because if they live underwater you know how their eyes kind of look they got pretty good size eyes small mouth are very visual fish and their eyes are very if you look at them they're, they're very detailed you know have you ever seen that like gold color that goes around their eye yeah. Some of them are orange. Some of them are red. Some of them have brown eyes to an extent. But I wonder how well they see out of the water. Like, I wonder if the water magnifies their vision so that, so that they can see. I wonder if their vision is just blurry when you pull them out of the water. I think of these things while I'm fishing. I really, really, really think smallmouth are way more of a visual predator than a largemouth or a spotted bass. 100% agree with that. So. Oh, I do too. I, I think that they would rather see it and chase it then wait for it to come to them. Now, we do have another question here for you before we get to even more baits. Uh, Greg, again, 
Uh, do the colors correspond to the colors of the crayfish? Absolutely, Greg. That's what we were just talking about. Yeah, that's what, that's what we think anyways. Yeah, I think so. All righty. So what else you got for us in, in Santa's workshop? Oh, um, let's see here. I got all that. Oh, one of my favorites, but they don't seem to be paying off for me right now. They will, though. Um, jerk baits. <clears throat> the wow. uh, Rapala um, X wraps. I like the XR XR eight size. And this one right here is that um, what's that called? Hot steel. I wanted to make it get it right. People like that color. And then just the good old Lucky Craft American Shad. This is the pointer 78, but you can get away with the pointer. You can fish a pointer 65, pointer 78, or pointer 100 in the wintertime. 100, people are like, man, that thing looks like a musky bait. No, they'll hit it. They'll hit it. Do so, you just fish both sizes, or which size do you like to start off with? 78. 78, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then and then if, if, you can get, if you can get bit on it, then maybe – switch go up i would prefer to go go up in size once you get bit on the 78 to see um you know if, if to see if you can get better quality fish with a bigger bait right because bigger baits do catch bigger fish i agree um but if you're using that pointer 78 and you're you know you're you're only catching a fish here and there maybe switch to the pointer 65 because then you'll probably catch more fish, possibly. That's right? A really good one. Yeah. Dude, no, that's awesome. No, I'm learning a lot here. Um, well, what else you got for us? And then one other thing. This is all for winter fishing right now. I'm not going to get into the, to like, you know, warmer water because that's, we're a couple months away from that. And then uh, this one right here. Can you guys see it? Oh, man. <laughs> Can you see it? The jig head? That's a uh, mushroom. That's my finesse jig head. Huh. That's a, uh, this is a nasty hook, man. I don't know if you can see it very well. Is that a, uh, is that a one-aught, two-aught? It's a number one hook. Number one hook? Why, extra wide gap, number one hook. Mm. It's just an absolutely nasty hook. And um, I like using 332nd. And if I feel like um, the water's not moving real fast and I'm fishing in current, I'll go to a 1 16th. Or um, if it's moving a little bit faster, try 1 8th. But those are my three uh, favorite sizes. Hmm. And then I sell them in um, green pumpkin and black. So, and if you wanted them uh, unpainted, I can sell them to you unpainted too. That's freaking awesome. All right. So while you grab uh, your next round of baits, I'm going to get a question. I'm going to get one of these questions here. Uh, this one was from earlier. They weren't able to make the live stream, but they wanted to make sure they got it answered from a couple of Patreon uh, supporters. Uh, for, uh, the first one is, uh, will smallmouth ever be in shallow ledge areas in the winter? I fish the Susquehanna, and there are lots of ledges in less than five feet. 100 percent they do um that's one thing we were talking about a little bit earlier is if you only fish lakes your your conception your, the concept of what's deep is a little um can be off at times those fish will get in a three-foot hole a four-foot hole and that i think that's really in parallel with this other question that's up here that big dtv was talking about um there are two rapids keeping fish in an area that doesn't get much deeper they will be if I caught multiple 20 plus inch fish during the winter in a five to eight foot deep trench. Uh, and to contextualize what Big D was saying is there's a place that he fishes where there's rapids that kind of keep or waterfalls that keep the fish in this, this stretch of it. And they are going to winter in whatever they can winter in. And if that is, you know, four feet, that's where they're going to winter. And I think the interesting part here is uh, let's go. There's two parts. One is you have to fish at a, at a pace so that way you can find these wintering holes here's the boogie once you find some of these wintering holes they're going to be wintering holes pretty much year round at that flow rate 
Um, and that's the last piece of the puzzle there that I don't think people really talk about as much. And this was with, with um, <clears throat> when I went out fishing with a friend. Um, he was talking about how, like, you know, the area that he was in, he remembers back to when the flow weight, when the flow rate was a certain speed and all the fish were there and it could, the fish were there, they were stacked up and we caught them really good here. But the water level at that, in, in these areas were like two or three feet higher or maybe a foot higher. It's not that way anymore. And the fishing was, was probably not as spectacular as it would have been if the water was back up there. So if you find fish on a log and the river is at, you know, a two feet high, write that down and memorize it, put a pin on your map. And then if by, you know, if for some reason you're fishing and then you go back out there in two weeks and it's like, you go back to that same log, but the water's a foot lower, that's going to get rid of all those spots. So you need to know your flow rate and your, in your water level. Cause that's, that's really important for your wintering holes. If your wintering hole is right on the bank and the water level is at three feet and you go back there in a week and the water's at, you know, a foot lower, they might have moved to a different wintering hole. So make sure you have a couple of wintering holes mapped out and then you can hit a bunch of them. Um, and I think this is, and the last thing before I get, uh, I'll let Jeff talk again, what hurts is when you have a professional angler like Jeff who has, let's say he has 10 wintering spots. He can move a little bit faster because he knows these are, these are the 10 wintering spots I'm gonna hit today. I'm gonna move, boom, 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 and hit them. If you've never fished the upper tummock before, I suggest take a section and just fish that whole section and then go and fish another section. And then you will create your own little waypoints of your wintering holes. Then the next time you go out, you can move a little bit quicker, but it's really hard if you've never been on the river to find a bunch of holes um, to go through. So anyway, I'll stop talking because you guys aren't here for me. Jeff, what do you got? So here, here's another one. It's my SWFA ba bug bait. It's about three and a half inches long. I know it kind of goes above what I, uh, can you guys see it okay? Yeah, this is a good bait in the winter time as well. It, it kind of mim it mimics a uh, Helgramite. And I have them in green pumpkin, um, watermelon brown, and uh, black. Like this one, black and gold. And then um, here's something to uh, throw that on. These can be used all year round. Um, I don't know how many people know about Charlie Brewer slider head. I use them in the summertime and the wintertime. I have um, the two that I like the size is um, uh, 1 16th and uh, 1 8th. And these are, uh, I, think, I believe these are one odd hooks. These are one odd hooks. These, these, are, these are excellent. And you can get these hooks back too because they'll, um, uh, they have a little bit of a, a flex to them when you go to pop them off something. They're not going to just stick in there and stay there forever. That's really important to know um, with your weight size and your hook size. That That's freaking awesome. Dude. And then those, you know, or I should have said this too earlier, the jig heads that I sell for the tubes, the ball head jigs, I use what they call, an, um, I guess this is kind of like an Aberdeen hook. You guys ever heard of an Aberdeen hook? It's a type of hook that it, it's designed, um, to, it flexes. So you can get those tubes back, get pretty easy. You'll get the tube back and the hook will be kind of bent out. That's not a big deal. Just bend it back with pliers. It's not going to bend down on a small mouth. Now, if you hooked a uh, a big carp or a, a giant muskie, he's going to bend that thing out. He's going to bend it out regardless. But um, I'm fishing for small mouth. So those uh, those number one hooks that I use and number two hooks, uh, yeah, just bend them back and keep using them. Unless they're just completely mangled. Right on, right on, right on. So... Um... Since I know we're getting closer to, to time here, what um what what else do you have in, in Santa's workshop that you'd like to to share the great people here? Oh, let's see here. I got these. I went over some reels. Um, I mean for the springtime, I have the. Um, uh, I don't think a lot of people associate chatterbaits with smallmouth. Chatterbaits, chatterbaits catch big. Small no. mouth in the, in, the, in the springtime. I mean, spring's right around the corner. It'll be here before we know it. You know, late March, early April. Um, but here, let me let me show you. That's a good point. Yeah, spring is... We got two months, guys. Isn't that crazy? Two months, it's going to be March. 
Um, and I think spring here is a little weird because I really think we have a late winter season here, I, th- I feel like. And even though the, the – well, that would be a good topic. It's just about those philosophies yeah, so about fishing seasons and how they change. Cause, for the chatterbaits, I think uh, – I mean, a lot of people associate them with uh, largemouth. They get kind of a bad rap for that. But um, but these river small – this is a half-ounce chatterbait. They'll hit this in the springtime mm. with without any – um. Uh, you know, thinking about it, they'll they'll smack this thing. And then I've got the uh, three eighth ounce, and I've got them in several colors. But you'll notice they all have the wow. same color theme. They're dark brown, green, something like that, or it's something like this with chartreuse. And I think the best way to fish those is with a uh, um, find uh, uh, your favorite type of um, swim bait or plastic and put on the back of them as a trailer. I usually don't fish these by themselves. Mm. I always have a trailer on them. I don't know why I just do. I'm sure they'll hit them regardless. But um, but spinner baits, I'll fish them without trailers. So, but I mean these things catch monster that's, small that's, mouth. That's uh, oh. just chatter baits in general, yeah, not Z Man, but chatter baits in general catch monster small mouth in the spring. Now you have to have the right conditions. All these lures are all. Um, they they have their they have their place. They're all tools, and um, they're situational. So, you know, you want you're going to want higher water in the spring, uh, maybe some dirty water, um, water that's heavily stained, and uh, they'll work. And then sometimes they'll hit these over a spinner bait. They they won't even touch a spinner bait, and you'll what? throw a chatter bait out there, and they'll hit it right in the same spot. At what temperature, at what water temperature do you start throwing a chatterbait, a crankbait? Probably in the um, once, it's, baits? once it's up in the 60s and it's not coming down. 60 degree water. You could probably catch them in 50, but I'm still throwing those jerk baits, man. Yeah, that's and that really gets into this next question here from Greg. Greg again asks, Jeff, how long is what your pause when you're fishing a jerk bait? Oh, uh, it could be minutes, five minutes. You just let it sit out there. Yeah. Dude, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, any other baits that you want to show us? Anything else that you have going on in your store? I don't have anything else right now. I'll give, uh, I'll have a, um, once this uh, podcast is over with, I'll have Thomas put a link down below and it'll be a, a 15% discount. All right. So guys, so this is a, just for you guys to let you know, go check out uh, Facebook page and the Patreon. I'll be dropping that link today as well. This will be re-uploaded later on the week. Um, I know this is a bad time for podcast episodes because of the uh, the holidays. But uh, this is a great time of year to fish, especially when you get these days that are like with no wind. I oh, really, yeah. The wind is what sucks balls. I remember Jeff and I went out. It was like negative six, 20 mile an hour winds. We still caught 20 pounds. Uh, we still caught 20 pounds. But that wind is what gets you, man. It, that wind just it cuts through you. But when it's not windy out, it can be down downright gorgeous out in the river this time of year. And you know, people um they want they want to check the water temperature, they want to check this and that. The best time to go is when you can go fishing True. in the winter. It it doesn't matter because the conditions could look like they suck, and you'll go out there and catch twenty five fish. Mm-hmm. You just never know. What and I, I I try never to have any type of um expectations whatsoever when i go fishing none at all like that beginning of your video that guy he's talking about expectations he says it's great because you just never know Mm -hmm. it's true it is true yeah i mean that that's why we go fishing and i i want to finish off with a story what was the best day you've ever had winter fishing just in your life in general um i'm trying to think back um, I've had days where I've caught, uh, multiple fish that were 20 inches or bigger. Um, that one day on the Susquehanna where we were in one hole alone, we caught 30 fish. Damn. Probably that day. Damn, dude. That's freaking awesome. I don't know if they're the same fish over and over again, but, um, we caught 30 fish in one hole. Did you think it was going to be that good when you, when you woke up no. that morning? Mm-mm. And um, I fished that hole. I I fished that hole all the time. I've still never caught that many fish out of it since. 
wintertime fishing, right? Yeah. And then here's a, here's a little trick. I don't know if people know this or not. I like doing it. So if you're winter fishing and, you, and you're in a boat, I guess it could work if you're, if you're using waders and you're getting out there in the, in the cold water. Um, but you get up to an eddy that's being, um, that's formed by a rock, like a mid river eddy that there's a big rock, a, a rock, you know, that's, it's pretty much level with your boat and it's creating this giant eddy. You want to fish above the, you want to be above the rock and throw a, over the rock into the eddy. They have no clue you're there. They can't hear you. They can't, they can't see you. They can't feel the trolling mode. They can't, they, they have no clue you're there. And if they're in there, you're going to nail them. And what's yeah. fun is it's amazing how easy they slide over rocks. You wouldn't yeah. think they do, but they go right over a rock. Jeff always drops the knowledge here, guys. Uh, he is an absolute legend. Uh, we're going to have some fun things that we're going to schedule at his shop uh, this winter, doing his boats, doing a, a shop tour. All that's going to be coming. Uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for everything. Like, subscribe to the channel. Ever, everyone, have an awesome Merry Christmas Happy New Year, and I, we're all going to see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. See ya. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.